What's up guys, my name is Anthony and today we're going to be taking an in-depth look at one of my absolute favorite plants, Cephalotus follicularis, also known as the Australian pitcher plant or more specifically the Albany pitcher plant. Let's get to it. To start, why is it called Cephalotus follicularis? Well, the first part, Cephalotus, is derived from the Greek word for head, and the second part, follicularis, comes from the Latin word meaning little sac, both in reference to the shape of this species' pitchers. Cephalotus is a monotypic genus, which means that it only contains one species, Cephalotus follicularis, the star of this video. Interestingly, the species is classified as an advanced rosid, which means that it is more closely related to apples and oaks than it is to other pitcher plants like Nepenthes and Saracenia. As far as conservation status goes, Cephalotus follicularis is currently listed as vulnerable, which means that it has been categorized by the International Union for Conservation of Nature as being threatened with extinction unless the threatening circumstances are fixed. Vulnerability is mainly caused by the destruction of a species' natural habitat, so we have to be very careful not to cause any more damage to the environment in which this species grows, and we should also be taking some efforts to remedy any damage that we may have already done. When we take a look at this species' native range, we can see that it's limited to a very small portion of the extreme southwestern part of Australia, around Albany and Esperance Bay, between Augusta and Cape Reach, hence the nickname the Australian or Albany pitcher plant. As you can see here, January and February tend to be the hottest months, with average temperatures around 79.2 degrees Fahrenheit or 26.2 degrees Celsius, and occasional record peaks reaching over 100 degrees Fahrenheit or roughly 43.3 degrees Celsius between October and April. The coolest months are June, July, August, and September, with average temperatures comfortably above freezing, between 46 and 49.1 degrees Fahrenheit, or 8.3 and 9.5 degrees Celsius, with record dips touching down to just above freezing at around 33 to 35 degrees Fahrenheit, or 0.8 to 1.5 degrees Celsius. When it comes to rain, Esperance gets an average of 24 inches, or 617 millimeters a year, with the coldest months being the rainiest. As far as humidity goes, this region is about as stable as it gets all year round, ranging from 57 to 61% with an average of 58%. Lastly, when it comes to sunlight, the yearly average is 8.1 hours a day, with highs of over 10 hours from November to February, and lows of 5.7 to 6.3 hours from April to August. Alright, now let's check out the plant itself. If you take a look at a handful of Cephalotus specimens, you'll likely notice a few things. The first is that they have two distinct growing stages an immature one, where the pitchers are tiny and lack most of the detail found in their mature counterparts, and a mature one, where the pitchers grow much larger, reaching a few inches in height, and develop far more intricate details. The immature pitchers have far fewer teeth than do the mature ones, and the ones that they do have aren't nearly as menacing. The second thing that you'll notice is that, very interestingly, this species produces two kinds of leaves, carnivorous ones in the form of pitchers, which are able to absorb nutrients from captured prey, and non-carnivorous ones, which are comparatively very simple looking and provide nutrients via photosynthesis. This is what a bisected mature pitcher looks like. You can clearly see the colorful and partially translucent lid, which helps prevent the pitcher from overfilling with rainwater and being unable to catch prey. The ridges, which help guide prey to the top of the pitcher, which often produces nectar that acts as another lure, the toothy ridge, which provides the perfect ledge off of which prey can fall into the trap, the slippery ridge right under the teeth, which makes it nearly impossible for prey to climb back out, and the well, where glands produce the digestive fluids necessary to break down captured prey into a more absorbable slurry. Alright, now we're going to get to the really fun stuff. I'm going to go over everything that you need to know in order to be able to successfully add this amazing species to your own collection. When it comes to lighting, Cephalotus like it bright. Very bright. I keep mine several inches under a mix of 3000K and 65K T5 high output bulbs, and as you can see they color up very nicely and never show any signs of burning. Just make sure that they aren't so close to the lights that the heat from the bulbs causes any damage. This is something that you're going to have to experiment with, using some thermometers and a bit of patience. Set the thermometer on top of your plant, and then check on it every 10 to 15 minutes, making small adjustments to the distance between the top of your plant and your bulbs. In my experience, if your Cephalotus is fully green, it can use some more light. Under my intense lighting setup, all of the clones that I have color up to varying degrees. One thing to note is that I've yet to grow any of my own Cephalotus specimens under LEDs, which can be far more powerful than T5 bulbs, so I'm not exactly sure what is the upper limit for how much light intensity they can handle, but if you're using T5s, it seems like they can pretty much handle as much as you can give them so long as you keep them several inches away. As far as how long you should keep the lights on, personally, I prefer an 18 hour photo period for most of the year, and then a 12 hour photo period for about 3 to 4 months during the winter to stimulate flowering. Now let's take a look at Cephalotus growing media. 
This is pretty simple, but there are a few choices and some are better than others depending on your overall growing conditions, so you may want to do a bit of experimentation to find out which one works best for you, though in most cases all of these should work pretty well. The first option is a mix of peat, perlite, and silica sand, with 25% peat, 25% perlite, and 50% silica sand. This mix is excellent for draining. The second is pure long-fibered sphagnum moss. This is the stuff that you find already dried up in bags. The third option is a mix of long-fibered sphagnum moss and perlite. The addition of perlite is to add a little bit more aeration. And finally, the fourth option is pure live sphagnum moss. Personally, whichever mix I use, I like to top it off with about an inch of live sphagnum moss because one, it looks really nice, and two, it has some antimicrobial properties which I suspect may help mitigate the risk of rot. Out of all of those, my favorite mixes are the long fibered sphagnum moss topped with the live stuff or just straight live moss, as the sphagnum moss tends to hold just the right amount of moisture while providing enough air around the root system to foster excellent growth. Something to note is that in my mostly closed off mini terrarium, which has much less airflow and often has higher levels of humidity, especially right after being watered, my cephalotus plants did not fare very well in long fibered sphagnum moss and seemed to do much better in a very sandy and well draining peat mix. I'm not 100% sure why, but I suspect that it stays too moist in there and the moss starts to rot. So as I said before, do a little bit of experimentation here and you'll find a sweet spot. It shouldn't be too difficult. Now we're going to take a look at watering, and this one can be a bit controversial. Personally, I don't keep my cephalotus pots in standing water or even in trays because I prefer to allow any excess water to drain out and away from the bottom of the pot so that the media and bottom of the root system don't rot. That said, I do water them daily so they never get to dry out. This is where it gets a bit controversial. I pretty much exclusively top water my cephalotus and the plants get completely soaked in the process. A lot of people believe that wetting your cephalotus crowns will cause them to rot, but in my almost 10 years of growing them, I've yet to have that happen to me even once. And I suspect that the reason for this is the fact that I keep an oscillating fan blowing over my entire plant collection all day, every day. And between that airflow, the relatively low to moderate humidity levels in my grow room, and the heat from the lights, none of the leaves or crowns or any tissue above the media level ever gets to stay wet for more than a very brief period of time. Lastly, as with all carnivorous plants, you're going to want to use water that is pretty pure. I get away with using tap water here in New York City because it measures just at the limit where I'm comfortable doing so, around 40 ppm using a TDS meter, but if you don't have a meter to check your water, I'd probably just go with distilled. You don't want to be using hard water and have mineral or other chemical buildup slowly kill your precious plants. If you do opt to use tap water, it can help to do a distilled water flush every once in a while, though I will admit that I haven't done so in years and none of my plants seem to mind. Something else that doesn't seem to bother my cephalotus very much at all is going for extended periods of time without being manually fed. I'm not sure if they've been catching any prey, but if they have been, it's only been a very small amount as the only visible animals that I have in my collection are springtails and the occasional predatory mites. That said, feeding should speed up their growth, and when I do feed mine, I personally like to use this Buried Treasure Guano Solution, pretty heavily diluted. Maxi and crushed beta pellets are decent options as well, but this one is my favorite. Once every week or two, I use a pipette to fill up as many pitchers as possible. Just be sure to use a very light concentration to avoid burning them. Also, experiment on one or two before going and feeding a whole bunch. Next up is temperature. Unfortunately, this is one area where cephalotus are pretty hardy. In my care, the temperatures they experience range from the high 80s in the summers down to the low 40s in the winter, and they don't seem to mind sitting at either end of the spectrum. I know some people say that they can tolerate a light frost, but if it's not absolutely necessary, I would avoid it because there's always a fine line between no damage and irreversible tissue death when dealing with freezing temperatures. Personally, I don't like the risk. When it comes to humidity, again, cephalotus seem to be pretty flexible, thriving in my care from around 65% in the summers down to about 30% in the winter. In relation to crown rot and cephalotus sudden death syndrome, as I alluded to before, I suspect that keeping your plants under 70% humidity would help prevent any issues because the lower the ambient humidity, the faster the leaves and crowns can dry up after being watered. If you are growing your cephalotus in a high humidity environment, such as in a terrarium, you might want to consider trying to avoid soaking the plant when you're watering it. Now let's move on to flowering. In my experience, the only way I've gotten a cephalotus plant to flower is by giving it somewhat of a winter season. I did so by lowering the grow room temperature by opening a window and switching the lights from a photo period of 18 hours down to one of 12 hours for a total of between 3 and 5 months. If your plant has been given sufficient winter conditions, you should notice a flower stalk starting to form toward the end of winter or the beginning of spring depending on your timing with changing the lights. What you're going to want to do is let the stalk form and once the many beautiful individual flowers start to open up, you're going to want to use a very soft and fine tipped paintbrush to spread the pollen around onto the stomata of as many open flowers as possible. 
because the flowers don't all open at the same time and because the pollen doesn't ripen at the same time, you're going to want to continue doing this until the entire bunch has finished growing and has started to shrivel up. If you did a good job, you should see the flower pods starting to swell up and some seeds should start to poke out in the coming weeks. Lastly, we're going to take a look at three ways to propagate your cephalotis. The first is via seeds. If you do manage to successfully pollinate your plant, be sure to plant the resulting seeds as soon as possible because they don't remain viable for very long. I'd personally plant them on a sterilized peat silica sand mix and keep them covered in a bag or under a dome until they have grown into little plants with root systems that can uptake enough water to support themselves in the open air, at which point I'd start to slowly acclimate them down to room humidity. I sterilize my media by microwaving it for a few minutes. Just make sure that it's very wet before you do so. Microwaving dry peat can cause a fire, so don't do that. Now some people recommend cold stratifying your cephalotis seeds, which means putting the entire bagged up seedling pot into the refrigerator for 4-8 to eight weeks. Personally, I haven't gotten to experiment with this, so I'm not going to tell you whether or not you should do it, but from what I've read, it seems like it's not necessary, although it may be helpful. I actually have a cephalotis seedling that popped up in a pot near one of my mature plants that had recently flowered, and I did absolutely nothing for that seed, so that's pretty cool. A second way to propagate your plant is via pullings. For this method, people have reported success using both non-carnivorous leaves and pitchers, but in my personal experience, sticking to non-carnivorous leaves is your best bet as they tend to strike pretty readily and they are less susceptible to rotting than our fully formed pitchers. Instead of cutting the leaves off, grab them as close to the base as possible and gently pull downward until they pop off the plant. Then all you have to do is set the leaves on top of some live sphagnum moss in a Tupperware, gently cover the wounded ends with a little bit of the moss, Place a cover on the Tupperware with a few air holes, and get ready to be patient for several weeks to months. This process takes a long time, but it's worth it, especially if you do multiple pullings at once. The last method of propagation that I'm going to cover is repotting and division, and to do so, I'm going to show you exactly how I go about it. We're going to be using that plant right there, a nice mature plant in a solo cup, which has been an eyesore for a while. The cup that is... Um, needs a nice new pot so I'm going to be splitting it in two to show how to divide them as well as showing how I just clean them up in general. Alright so the first step is to put on some gloves keep your hands clean from any bacteria or fungal spores that can be in the moss or in any kind of dirt you're dealing with. Then I like to pour out the pitcher water that's actually all water that the pitchers have made themselves or that has gotten in there from top watering. I don't intentionally fill them but they do produce their own so I just pour it out to not make a mess later on. Here what I'm doing is squeezing the sides of the cup to loosen the media off of the walls of the pot so that none of the roots break as it's coming out. And then just take off the large chunks as you saw me do right there. Some of them should just fall off without breaking any of the roots. After you get the big chunks off, like you see me doing right now, I'm just either using two fingers or even needle nose tweezers to pick out all the moss from in between the pitchers and around the crown. The reason I am not leaving any bits in there is because there are other kinds of moss in there as well, like star moss. And that kind of moss, one, looks ugly, and two, makes the media much more dense. And I tend to notice that my plants covered in that stuff do not do as well as the stuff growing in pure sphagnum moss. So I pick it all out. Right here, what I'm doing is trying to tease apart two of the growth points, and actually one of them snaps off right about here. You can see it doesn't have any black roots, but it does have a nice chunk of rhizome, so I'm going to bury that whole thing and bag it for a, like about a week or so, so hopefully it can put out some new roots of its own. Alright, the next step is just filling up some pots. Basically, I like to use between 50 and 75% LFS, which is the dried, long-fibered sphagnum moss. I'll fill the bottom of the pot up with that, water it to make sure it's all completely soaked, mix it a little bit with my fingers, that way you just make sure the whole thing is moist. Due to the structure of the roots on these cephalotuses, I am using this kind of moss filling technique, where you just mostly put a little layer on the bottom, and then fill the outside, stick your root ball or rhizome in the middle, and then fill a little bit around that. Once you're done with that, you can start putting in the live sphagnum moss on top. And then water it one more time to make sure everything settles in nicely and that all the media is in contact with the plant roots. 
right? I'm just doing the same thing on a second pot now. This one didn't really have any fibrous roots, so I was able to just do the LFS on the live sphagnum moss at the same time. I used the same technique of covering the bottom and then filling up around the outside so I could stick the plant in the middle. Then I pushed the moss around to make sure it makes good contact with the rhizome and watered it once more for good measure. Since this one had no fibrous roots, I am bagging it, but I'm only going to do so for about a week, maybe two tops, and probably after that I'm going to start putting some holes in it because I noticed that the only time cephalotis tend to rot for me is when I leave them bagged up in high humidity environments during quarantine. If you guys found this video helpful, please click like, and if you have any questions, drop a comment below and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. Also, don't forget to click subscribe and hit that notification bell icon so you don't miss out on any of the awesome carnivorous plant videos that are coming up. See you next time on A Bug's Nightmare. The International Carnivorous Plant Society wants you to be successful with your plants. We welcome growers just getting started all the way through professional scientists. We started an annual World Carnivorous Plant Day to celebrate these spectacular plants. Take a look around our website and you'll find historic documents about carnivorous plants, growing guides, free educational resources, and more. Have questions? Ask. We don't bite. But our plants do.